have noticed that most armoires or linen presses are too big for today's rooms to fit in there and look just right? Well, here's a piece that I think is perfect. This is a linen press that came out of a convent in Pennsylvania. It's made out of pumpkin pine and the size is perfect. It's only about a foot deep. It's about six feet tall and three feet wide. Not too fancy, a little molding around the top here, although I think that might have been added later. The doors are original, hand-planed raised panels, nice bead detail along the edge, and the tenons for the rails and stiles are held together with square pegs. Now, if we look on the inside, you can see the shelves, which I think are replacements. It looks like a white pine. Now, they're fixed in place. The back of the unit also has some repair. Little strips have been put over the joints of the boards to cover up gaps. Now, this is a fairly simple project to build, but what's really nice about it is the size. Well, everyone who's seen the prototype of our linen press has been impressed by its size, as we were with the antique original. Now, it's not big enough to put in a TV, but it's just right for towels or linens, maybe even sweaters. And it'll fit in just about any size room. In fact, I think I'm going to put it in my bathroom to store towels. The only changes that I made to the original was to the shelves. I actually added one, and I made all of them adjustable. And I didn't like the molding around the top of the antique original, so I came up with a slightly different profile. Now, I built the linen press out of some more of our antique timbers. These came out of homes or buildings that were dismantled. We bring them here to the shop. I take all the nails out of them, cut away the material that's not good, run it through my surface planer. And the end result are boards like this. Now, you can't go to a home center and buy material like this. The patina, the color of the pine, and all the character is just beautiful, especially when it's finished. I want to start today by sizing the top and the fixed bottom shelf. And to do that, I'm going to start at my joiner. I want to put one straight edge and square. And the joiner is the best tool to do that. Before we use any power tools, however, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I place the jointed edge against my rip fence, which I've set to be a 32nd of an inch wider than the finished width that I need so I can make one cleaning pass back at the joint. Now I want to square up the end of each board and cut them to length. I suppose I could do that at the radial arm saw, but I like to use my panel cutter at the table saw. It's a very accurate jig. And one thing I would never do is try to cross cut a board of this width just using my miter gauge. It has such a short fence length to it. With one end square, I can now hook my tape over that end, measure the piece for length, and cut the other end. Now I'll size the side panels exactly the same way. Next, I need to mill a dado in each side panel to receive the fixed shelf at the bottom. To do that, I'm going to use my stack dado head cutter, which is set up for 3 quarters of an inch width and a quarter inch depth. Now, because this is a wide board, I'm able to guide it through the cutter just using my rip fence. Any narrower, and it might be dangerous. The key is to keep your eye along the intersection of the fence and the board, making sure it doesn't move. That would be unsafe. Now, I've just set the table saw up to mill a rabbit. The same dough head cutter is in here. It's been raised to 3 eighths of an inch. I've installed a sacrificial fence because I actually have to slide the fence over the blade a bit to create the rabbit. Let me show you what the rabbit is for. Along each side panel, there's a rabbit so that the backboards will be slightly recessed and they won't show through the edges. 
If you take a look at the prototype, you'll see that there's a cutout at the bottom of the side panel, and that creates these small legs. I've laid out the panel, and I'm going to actually just use a handheld jigsaw to make the cut. Now it appears that the front edge here is a little bit narrow, but once the face frame has been added, both legs will be equal. My oscillating spindle sander is perfect for smoothing up the cuts. The next operation is to come up with a system for the adjustable shelves. Now I could use tracks that could be either recessed or surface mounted, but this system has the least visual impact. Just a series of holes that take these small metal clips. There are several ways to drill the holes. I've even used a brad point bit and a piece of pegboard to set them up. But today I'm going to use this jig. It's a heavy piece of metal with a series of large holes, which would be the actual pin locations. Then there are more holes which take a guide pin, and I happen to lose one of the metal ones, so I'm using a dowel here. And that controls the distance from the edge of the piece to the center of the holes. Two clamps, which will hold the jig onto the side. All I have to do is line up the center mark on the jig with the center mark on the height of the side panel and clamp it in place. Now to drill the holes, I'm actually going to use a router with a collar that fits snugly in the large holes and a quarter inch straight cutting bit. Okay, well that works great. Now I'll just reset the jig and drill some more holes. Now I'm ready to set up the other column of holes. And for that, I have to change the pin location because there's no rabbit along the front edge of the piece. So I want to be at inch and three quarters, which would be this hole right here. Push the pin in, slide the jig back in place, and route some more holes. Here I've installed the top for the case with the underside facing up, laid out for a stopped dado. This is the front of the piece, and I don't want the dado to show through. I want it to stop right here. To mill the dado, I'm going to use my router, which is set up with a 3 quarter inch straight cutting bit and a guide fence. The edge of the bit is an inch from the guide fence. The back of our linen press is covered with half inch thick pine boards, random width, whatever I could get out of my antique lumber, and the edges are joined with a simple tongue and groove joint. I'm set up at the table saw to mill the grooves first. I've set up a feather board so the stock will be tight up against the fence. I'm just using the saw blade. I'll make one pass on one face, turn it around, make another pass, and that assures me that the groove is perfectly centered. To mill the tongue down the edge of each board, I've set up my stack dado head cutter with the two outside blades, which gives me a quarter inch. I've installed the sacrificial strip, which goes over the blade a sixteenth of an inch, which will result in a three sixteenths inch tongue. The feather board will keep the stock tight to the table as I run it through. Well, now we're ready for a little assembly. Some glue in the dados and I'll install the piece and blind nail them to secure them while the glue sets. All right, now for the other side. We'll slip them into the dados. All right. And I just want to tap it flush on the front. Now this method of nailing, blind nailing, where I angle the nail up through the shelf, it actually passes through the shelf, the dado, and into the other side of the side piece. And rather than have a nail that goes straight in from the end, which could pull out, this is across the joint, making it stronger. Now I'll check the piece for squareness by measuring the diagonals, 79 and 13 that way, 
and 79 and 13 that way. So we know the piece is square. The next thing I have to do is add a cleat along the top edge here to receive the backboards. A little bit of glue and a few brads is all I need to secure the cleat. The backboards are set in place dry, no glue. I want them to be able to expand and contract. The tongue and groove joint will keep them together. Just a couple brads on each end will take care of each board. Okay, the last board. Usually the toughest one to get in. Work it in there. All right, now just pry it up against the other one. Nail it in place. Here's another cleat, and this will actually back up the face frame rail. The face frame is made up of three pieces, a top rail and two styles that are about three inches wide, and at the bottom there's a decorative cut that matches the sides. I've cut my styles to length, laid out the cut, that's the first step. Join the face frame pieces to the carcass. I'm just going to use biscuits because I don't want nails to show. But number 20 biscuit every eight inches does a great job. Well, that's going to hold a lot better than nails. I'll just clamp it in place until the glue dries. Face frame rail just gets set in place with a little bit of glue. And I can use nails here because they'll be concealed by the molding later. Now this little block that I just made with the corners knocked off is going to act as a stop. And it's going to go right behind this top rail and the doors will close against them when they're shut. These are the rails and styles for the doors. And let me show you what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm making a groove first that will be in both the rails and the styles to receive the panels. Then a little bit later, we'll make some tenons which will join all the pieces together. To make the groove, I've set up my quarter inch dado, dado cutter and I've set the fence so that it's centered as close as possible on the board. I've installed a feather board to keep it tight against the fence. I run the piece through on one edge, turn it around and run the other edge for a perfectly centered groove. In each style, there are three mortises, like this one in the sample, to receive the tenons from the rails. They simply slide into each mortise. Now to make the mortise, I'm using my stationary dedicated mortiser with a quarter inch chisel, making mortises that are an inch and seven eighths deep. What I've been doing here is setting up to make the tenons on the rails, and this is my sample. The first cut is this shoulder cut on each face, and I've set up the rip fence to give me the exact distance that I want. Now as long as the blanks that I'm using for the rails have perfectly square ends, when I run the piece through, which is parallel to the saw blade, we'll have a square shoulder cut. The next cut that I want to make is this one right here to form the haunch in the tenon. And that's necessary because when the pieces are slipped together, we need a little bit left on the tenon to fill the gap of the groove. To do that, I've raised the blade to an inch, moved the fence 3 eighths of an inch closer, now the side that gets the haunch is the side opposite the groove on the top and bottom rails. The band saw completes the notch. To complete the tenons, I want to make the cheek cuts. 
which are made by passing it along the saw in that manner. Now, I wouldn't want to do those with anything else but this jig. The clamp holds the piece securely in place and safely as I push it through the saw. And this little knob right here is a micro-adjustment knob, which allows me to move the jig back and forth until I get the tenon just the right thickness to fit in that mortise. Next, I'm ready to raise the panels for our door. I'm using a specialty router bit, a panel raising bit here at my router table. And as you can see, that bit is going to remove a lot of material. So I like to do it in two passes. I also like to install a feather board because when you're taking away that much material, the wood wants to lift from the table. The feather board will keep it nice and tight. Now there is a sequence to raising panels. You want to do the section across the grain first. That way, if there's any tear out, it'll be removed when you do the edges of the panel. When I do the ends, I like to use this miter gauge with these clamp downs that holds the piece securely. With the first pass made on all the panels, I can raise the bit slightly, run a sample to make sure I have the exact profile I want, and complete the panels. Let's check the fit. That's good. We'll run the panels. I've taken the trouble to dry fit all the pieces together for the doors. The idea is to make sure everything fits okay and to mark the pieces for the next few steps. First, I want to make rabbits in the two rails that meet at the center of the door. On the left-hand door, I want the rabbit to be along this front corner. And on the right-hand door, I want it to be on the back corner. Here at the router table, I've set up a 3 8 inch rabbiting bit. And once again, I want to install a feather board to make sure that the style stays tight against the router table. The last thing that I have to do to the door parts before I can assemble them is mill this bead. There's one on this edge, one at the overlap, and one on this edge. And I do that because it's just a nice detail. So over here at the router station, I've set up a beading bit. Let me show you what one of those looks like. There's a series of different diameters, and this is the profile of each bit. The one I've installed is a 5 16 inch diameter. I've also installed a couple feather boards. I want to make sure that the stock stays tight against the fence and that it's tight against the table, because if it moves as I run the piece through, it'll ruin the bead. For the last several minutes, I've been applying glue to the joints for the doors. Inside the mortises, and then I'll put some on the tenons. I want to get a nice, even coat of glue on all the surfaces. And by getting a good coat of glue on those surfaces, when they cure, it creates an incredibly strong joint. Now for the panels. And there's no glue on the panel. I want that to float freely in the grooves so that it can expand and contract with changes in moisture. Okay, now we can put the other style on and clamp it up. Okay. Well, we're gaining on it. Now we can make the molding that wraps around the sides just under the top. We'll do that at the router station. I've installed this multi-profile bit in my router station. Depending what part of the bit you use, you can create all different types of moldings. I'm going to use the lower portion of the bit, which has a half round and then a little cove. And this is the piece of stock that I'll run through. One pass will make our molding. I like to put a little glue on the miter joint, and I'm just using some inch and a quarter brads to hold it in place. Now I've set the doors in the cabinet, 
with a spacer in the middle and a wedge at each corner to make sure they're perfectly positioned so I can mortise for these hinges, which are a little unusual. They're a drop pin hinge. And the shape would be very difficult to mortise, except for the fact that the hinges come from the same people who make a plate joiner. And they've matched the radius of the hinge to the radius of the cutter head. So instead of cutting slots for biscuits, I'm going to mortise for hinges. Now the layout is done by making a gauge that's equal to the thickness from the bottom of the joiner to the center of the cutter. And I just, by eye, align that with the center of the space, put a vertical line on here, and then a center line for where I want the hinge. To make the mortise, I just line up the plate joiner with its center line and the bottom of the plate, even with the vertical line. And one pass will mortise both the door and the style. Watch. And the hinge just fits in just like that. Couldn't be easier. Boy, that's fast and nice and flush. Where do you see how nicely these fit? The thing that I like is that you don't have to pull any pins to take these doors off. You just drop them on. All right. How's that? The shelves are just three-quarter inch thick boards, and I want to round over the front edge. To do that, I'm using the same multi-profile bit that I used earlier, except I'm using the upper round over section. Two passes through will do the job. Okay, well that pretty much takes care of the woodworking. A little final sanding and we'll be ready for the finish. We find that a lot of the color that comes out in this piece is from the old pine that we're using. And by adding this finish, which is actually a combination of a honey pine stain and polyurethane, that it brings out even more of the color and character to the piece. Now I'll put on three coats and do a light sanding between each coat. This seems to be the best finish for our antique pine. It's going to get a little darker with each coat, but when we're done, it's going to look perfect. Building these pieces out of recycled timber is expensive because of the cost of the material, and it's time consuming to get the material into a workable state, but it's worth it, don't you think? You can't get this look with new timber.